Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Let's all stand today. We'll lift up our prayer this morning to the Lord, prepare our hearts for some time of worship. So Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord. We give you glory today, honor and praise. Lord, for you created all things. By your will, they exist and were created. Lord Jesus, your king over heaven and earth, we lift up your name right now, the name above every other name, Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with this gathering today, Lord, this fellowship, that your spirit be poured out, Lord, that our hearts would be refreshed, be comforted, and Lord, that you would draw each of us closer to you, God, and our own individual walk with you, Lord. We're not Christians because we just come to a church, Lord, but because we know you, Jesus, we've accepted you, we've received you. And if there are any today, Lord, that haven't made that decision, we just pray for them right now, Lord, that they would. They would receive forgiveness of sins, eternal life. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us these things. We look forward to this, what you're going to do here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>
you could all be here with us today. Just a couple quick announcements. As you guys know, probably Easter Sunday, next Sunday. So just a reminder of what our service times are. So we have a Good Friday service at 6.30 p.m. Uh, and then for our Easter Sunday services, we have a sunrise service at 6.30 and also a 9 a.m., but no 11 a.m. And also today, um, we have something special happening in the fellowship hall. We have a group going to Tanzania for something called He Intends Victory. So this is a, a gospel outreach that's directed towards people who are impacted by HIV. And we have a whole group of people going from this fellowship over to Tanzania. It's going to be in June. And today in the fellowship hall, we have a bunch of baked goods and craft items. It's going to be a fundraiser for that group. So if you guys want to check that out, there's a lot of great things in there, a lot of crafts, a lot of baked goods. So uh, and that, let's just take a moment, too. Maybe we can just pray right now for that outreach. So Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, that our church has that opportunity, Lord, to um, support this outreach and that you're putting together this outreach to Tanzania, Lord, to uh, help those people impacted by HIV and to spread the gospel. We pray, Lord, the gospel would go forth powerfully, Lord, that people's you know, hearts would be healed, souls would be healed, and, Lord, that your will would be done through, that, through this upcoming trip and that you provide necessary funding, safety for the travel, and bless that trip um, in all ways, Lord, and all those going. Thank you for yes. those who have uh, volunteered, Lord to go on this outreach as well. So we ask for your blessing upon that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's take a moment, get around the room, greet one another in the love of the Lord.
transgressions of the remnant of your heritage, Lord. Cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea, Lord. You pardon iniquity. Thank you, Lord. You've forgiven us of all of our sins. Let's just take a moment in our own words right now. Just thank the Lord in your own words. Just out loud, praise his name. Lift up the name of Jesus.
Just take a time now. We can confess our sins to the Lord. The word tells us, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So we can confess our sins right now, Lord. We, we choose to repent. We turn towards you. worship is all about, Lord, not just singing songs, but it's, Lord, aligning ourselves with you. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Lord, we worship you in spirit and truth. We want to align ourselves with you, Lord, because we know that we grieve your Holy Spirit when we engage in sin, Lord, when we willfully sin, when we fall into sins. So we want to confess, Lord, we ask that you just refresh us right now by the power of your spirit. I pray for grace to be poured out, Lord, upon this congregation that you would Refresh our hearts, our spirits. Lift us up today, Lord. Times of refreshing would come. And Lord, not just for this congregation, we pray for this, ultimately this city of Tucson, this whole nation, Lord, this, this whole world, Lord, that times of refreshing would come from the outpour of your spirit. Lord, we pray, come, Lord Jesus. Lord, pour out your spirit. Turn this nation back pray for the leaders of our nation, Lord, they would turn back, they would repent, they would come to the light, Lord, know that you, Jesus, are our Messiah, the Savior. We lift up Israel as well, Lord, the, the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that our nation would stand strong support of Israel. We pray that you would please help defeat Israel's enemies. And Lord, just please quicken our hearts to love you in a, in a greater way. Maybe, Lord, this week we can just set it, we can make that dedication, Lord, to worship you wholeheartedly this week, to seek you, knowing all that you've done for us. We don't have to try to strive for acceptance or to get you to love us more. You already love us, Lord. We just, we have that full assurance of grace. Thank you for your grace, Lord God. We've received the gift of righteousness. It's not by anything we've done. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. And you know, this is one week before Easter, and it came to mind that, you know, what happened one week before before Jesus died and he, he rose again as we had the triumphal entry. He entered into Jerusalem as the as the Savior of Jerusalem. And all the people on Palm Sunday they call they were laying down their palms and their clothing and they were worshiping him, saying, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that word Hosanna just means save us. They're crying out, save us. But we can say we've already, we, we have that salvation. So as we sing this next song, let's be mindful of that, that Lord, you already saved us. We have so much to be thankful for. And Hosanna, we sing, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus.
you too guys if you have any uh, small children just head on over to the family fellowship center at this time if you'd like to worship in your uh, um, tithes and offerings we have the boxes by the exits or you can do so online and lord we thank you for this time of worship god that you've uh, done this work here today lord your spirit's moving we thank you we praise you and we ask that you um, touch pastor scott now and open up our hearts to receive your word in jesus name we pray amen You could turn me in your, your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 19 this morning. And while you're turning there, you know, not long after the earth cooled and dinosaurs still roam, in 1975, <laughs> I'm old enough to remember that, in 1975, a reconstituted rock band by the name of Fleetwood Mac uh, made their re-entry into uh, the Hot 100 on the Billboard charts with a song with a pretty compelling lyric. I'm over my head, but it sure feels nice. You know, I never forgot that song because I was a brand new Christian during that time, and I thought, you know, what Fleetwood Mac was singing about on the horizontal, the challenges and the ups and downs of romantic love, uh, is also very true in the Christian life, if you're doing it right. When you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, you, in essence, are asking God to put you in an over-your-head situation. Listen to how Simon Peter describes what the essence of the Christian life is all about. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 3, we read this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now notice Peter describes the basic, absolutely typical Christian life in this way. It's a living hope. Well, one thing that you can know for sure about something that is living, it can't be contained or explained apart from the life of God. You cannot imitate it. You cannot simulate it. You can only receive it and experience it by faith. And here's the bottom line. Our God is not a concept. Our God is not the result of philosophy. Our God is not the sum total of traditions that have been handed down to us through time. Our God is the true and living God who wants to show himself strong and powerful, involved and active in your life and my life in, dare I say, miraculous ways. In fact, in the book of Acts this morning, in Acts chapter 19, we are going to learn a thing or two about the supernatural nature of the essential Christian life. This is not something for super saints. This is not something for a handful of uh, spiritually advanced individuals who've risen above the rest of us. The principles of seeing God work in ways that are absolutely inexplicable, apart from his divine intervention, is a blessing he wants to give you and me on a far more regular basis than perhaps we might even be comfortable with. So this morning in Acts 19, we're going to see how the Lord continued to rock the ancient world from the city of Ephesus. And as we see, not just how God honored his word, but also began to do supernatural works, hopefully what you're going to get out of this this morning 
is not only a greater appreciation of the power and promises of God's Word, but also the real possibility that in the days ahead, God Himself is going to move and minister in and through your life in an absolutely inexplicable way apart from the miraculous. Now, if you were with us last week, we saw that uh, Paul had come back to the city of Ephesus. I think it's really interesting that he got the chance to minister there because in his first missionary journey, the, the, the time that he went through this region, he wanted to go to the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus, a bustling port city. It was uh, known for uh, having one of the most secure banks, believe it or not, in the ancient world. It was a hub of commerce and as such, very influential. When Paul was going through this territory, he immediately thought, wow, you know, what a wide open place to share the word. But the Holy Spirit prohibited him from going there. The Lord had other things for him to do. He sent him on to Macedonia over into Greece. But now he gets the opportunity to come on back. And the reason I just mentioned that to you right off the bat is understand something. A prayer request delayed does not mean a prayer request denied. There, there are some of you that have had major dreams that you've laid down before the Lord, things you've wanted to see him do within your life, and maybe God has just said to you, I just want you to wait. Well, that waiting is always an appropriate thing. If you were with us in our study in the book of Esther uh, this week, we saw how powerful it was that God's timing was absolutely perfect and confounded everybody that was involved in that process. You can uh, go online and catch up on that study if you'd like about God's amazing providence. But now it was time for Paul to minister in Ephesus. And we are told that his uh, approach to ministering in Ephesus was Bible-centered. He shared the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 8 of Acts 19, we are told, He went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. We saw last time that the uh, basic uh, imprint for making an impact with the good news of Jesus Christ is given to us here. Notice how Paul went into the synagogue and, first of all, was reasoning. It was a two-way dialogue we saw. It was a Q&A kind of a thing. Well, you know, there's the old saying, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. You, you really want to find uh, a way to express to people how much you care? Listen to them. Listen to them. Let them share what their point of view is, what their takes are. No matter how outlandish they might be, you might have to kind of, you know, uh, wince a little bit. But when they get done sharing, you will then be given all the information you, be, you will ever need to be able to skillfully and specifically share the love of Jesus Christ in a way that is really going to hit home with them. So, so Paul was good at reasoning. He was also good at speaking boldly. Uh, the, the word there carries the idea was he was on fire. Uh, when, when people hear you express what your relationship with God is all about, is it hallelujah or ho-hum? Uh, you know, I, uh, the old saying is true. There's no better advertiser than a satisfied customer. Are you a satisfied customer? Has Jesus Christ and his love changed your life? Has he forgiven your sins? Has he revolutionized your relationships? Well, then you've got a story to tell, and, and we should be bold about that. Uh, we shouldn't be shrinking violets. I realize that in our society, our culture, saying that, you know, again, one way is right and one way is wrong is a party foul. I mean, it's right up there with belching at the dinner table or slurping your soup. But Jesus was the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Do you believe that? Do you think other people need to believe that? Well, once again, uh, we need to be more bold about this. And uh, people appreciate that boldness. People appreciate that sense of certitude. Are you certain about your faith? But notice as well, he was also persuading them. And this is the, the, the point that I really want to emphasize to you. Paul was not opposed to, in a sense, closing the deal. Uh, you know, it, it's one thing to tell people everything they need to know to come to a saving relationship with God. But it's another thing uh, when, when the Lord gives us that wonderful opportunity to be the person who prays with someone and sees them come to know the Lord for the first time. 
Now, I remember back when I was in seminary, uh, it was a Saturday, and I had a massive Greek exam uh, the following Monday. So there I was in my little office in Agora Hills, California, uh, studying away with all my impressive uh, Greek texts and so on all over my desk when uh, the phone rang. And it was this kid from my youth group. Uh, his name was Brian. And, and Brian, well, you know, he, he had a lot of enthusiasm, maybe, you know, lacking a little bit in the social grace, but a really great kid. And he called me up. He goes, hey, Scott, I want to go door-to-door witnessing. Do you want to come with me? I went, oh, door-to-door witnessing. Are you kidding? Knocking on doors? Do I look like a Jehovah's Witness? Come on. But I thought, you know, I don't want to discourage you because, oh, all right, you know, I, can, I, I guess I can take a break, you know, let, let's go on down there and do that. So we went to this uh, housing development in Newberry Park, California, and, uh, you know, we, we, we started knocking on doors, and, and I just thought to myself, oh, Lord, I hope nobody's home, you know, I hope we can get this done soon, because I got to get back and, and think about the, the, the higher things in my Greek and, and so on like this. And so far, you know, Lord was answering my prayer. Nobody was home. Nobody was answering anyway. And uh, and so I'm I'm kind of going to Brian, well, you know, it doesn't seem like the Lord's opening up any doors for us. And then he looks down, and all the way at the end end of the colossae, he sees this lady uh, walking out her front door, going to her car. And he runs down the street and goes, hey, lady! The lady looks at her. Do you want to hear about Jesus? And I'm like, oh, gosh. Wow, this is so embarrassing that... Hey, you know, and the lady's standing by the car, and she's kind of stunned. She goes, well, you know, I, I guess I, I got him in. I said, oh, yeah, 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 ma'am. And, and, and you know, and, and I had my Steps to Peace with God track with me. And, and you know, and, and I'm just saying, I'm going to make this as quick as possible because I can see this lady's got somewhere to go. And I, you know, I'm feeling embarrassed about being here already, and I can't wait to get back to my Greek. And I went through, you know, the Steps to Peace with God. And finally, the last thing in the Steps to Peace with God track with, that Billy Graham put out, is this question, is there any good reason why you can't accept Jesus as your Savior right now? And I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm just going through it by road. I'm just staring down there. I'm not even looking at the lady. Finally, I get, is there any good reason for you to, uh, not to give your life to Jesus right now? And, and I look up for the first time, and this lady is staring at me, and she has tears running down her face. And she goes, I can't believe that you guys are here telling me about this. I've wondered about a relationship with God, and I hear all these things. And, and, and now, now if I, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to. And I went, really? <laughs> and Brian says, let's pray, lady. And all of that is to say, people are a lot more open about the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially in distressing and disturbing times like we live in today than you can imagine. You know, don't think, oh, they've probably heard it. They probably haven't. Don't don't think that, well, maybe they've gone to church. Well, I don't care if they've gone to church. You can go to church your whole life and not receive Jesus as your Savior. Some of you here today are regular churchgoers, but you've never received Jesus as your Savior. You've never had a, a conscious decision to ask him into your heart, to make him Lord of your life. Uh, if you haven't, this is your day. Paul would say if he were here, man, <laughs> I tell you what, uh, life's too short and eternity's too long to put that decision off another day. Don't walk through those double doors without settling that issue. And, and don't walk through those double doors without this conviction in your heart. Maybe, just maybe, you've got people in your life that will never darken the door of a church. Maybe, just maybe, you've got people in your life who, as soon as they find out, like someone like me as a pastor, turn off, uh, I know what you guys are all about. But they'll listen to you. They'll listen to you. And you don't have to have all the answers, and you don't have to be some silver-tongued evangelist. All you have to be is willing to persuade. And Paul was willing to persuade, and he was persistent about it. He kept at it for two years even though he got decidedly mixed reviews. And we are told at the end of that two years, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. You understand what happened there? Not only was Ephesus in in this territory of Asia, we would call it Asia Minor today. If you looked on a map, it would be basically the country we would call Turkey. Uh, There's this crucial Roman province right? The Paul so wanted to reach the first time he went through there. The Holy Spirit told him, no, now that province was reached. 
In fact, we mentioned this last week, but it bears repeating. Uh, the seven churches that we find in the book of Revelation all came to be because of this one outreach here at Ephesus. God did an incredible work. But, oh, I'll tell you something. It wasn't just the Word of God that was changing lives. God was also doing a supernatural uh, work, inexplicable uh, in no other way than the mighty arm and outstretched hand of God was visible and active in their midst. Look at verse 11. It says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, notice a couple of things here about the miraculous. As soon as we start talking miracles, some of you immediately default to what you've seen on Christian television or maybe what you've experienced at some miracle rally or, you know, some uh, evangelist come out. The Lord is going to heal the sick tonight and he's going to do mighty miracles here. And it's all because of this wonderful individual, uh, you know, with the Lucite pulpit and the pompadour and, and, and so on. Uh, you, you know, again, miracles, by and large, get bad press because we don't really understand them. We don't even really understand how they work. But boy, some key insights here. Notice, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, by this time, Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, has seen some pretty spectacular miracles. He goes, these ones were really weird. <laughs> really unusual. Now, understand something uh, about miracles. Sometimes we look at the book of Acts, and we read the New Testament, and, and we go, oh, of course, you know, back in that day and age, you know, there was a miracle every uh, three hours or so. You know, I mean, a miracle here, miracle there, miracles everywhere. But, you know, it's funny. When you do an analysis of the historical period that is covered in the book of Acts, you discover something really interesting and maybe even encouraging in a sort of a backhanded way for us today. The book of Acts covers roughly 30 years of history. From the time immediately following the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are left off prior to the time the Apostle Paul was beheaded on the Ostian Way outside of Rome. He still hadn't had his opportunity to share the gospel with Caesar yet. Now, we know from this that this was roughly about 30 years' worth of time. Do you realize in this 30-year period of time, in the book of Acts, we have roughly 11 major miracles described in this period of time? Now, I know it's Sunday morning. I know some of you guys didn't really like math too much, but I think you can follow me on this. That means that there was one major miracle roughly about every three years. You know, we, we think they happened, you know, a major miracle every three minutes, three hours or something. No, God intervenes miraculously, but not in a way that's willy-nilly. He always has purpose behind all of this. And, and, you know, when I think about the miraculous interventions that God has done within my life, and boy, there, there have been a few but it's not like I wake up in the morning and I go, okay, uh, God, you got uh, till noon to show me something really amazing. No, God does miraculous things. God does intervene in the life of his people. But even back during that time, uh, God was working in such a way that even Luke called it unusual. This was an unusual outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. Now, notice we are told God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. It was God doing the miracles here. And this is another thing that can keep you out of a pack of trouble. If you believe that the miraculous manifestation of the power of God's Spirit is localized in just one individual, you're setting yourself up for deception. You're setting yourself up for getting your eyes off of Jesus and onto human beings. And I guarantee you, that is not going to lead you anywhere you really want to go spiritually. Unfortunately, much of what we would call the modern charismatic movement, much of the signs and wonders movement in our day seems to be custom designed 
to get our eyes on the vehicle rather than on the God who uses the vehicle. But notice, God gets the credit. God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, there's a second thing you need to understand about the miraculous. God is the one who does the miraculous. We don't have to work people into a frenzy or get people into the right mood or play uh, the right songs or, or you know, have the right atmosphere in order for God to do the miraculous. God does the miraculous, but he also uses people to accomplish miraculous things. Regular, ordinary people. People who might even consider themselves, if you were to ask them, disqualified. Uh, the, the, the last person that God would ever use to do something miraculous. Uh, read how Paul viewed himself in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 8 through following. He says, I thank God he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly an insolent man and a blasphemer and a persecutor of the church. But God had mercy on me so that he could show others that you could save Paul, you could save somebody else. You see, you don't have to be some uh, over-the-top spiritual paragon for God to use in a powerful way. As a matter of fact, God delights in using what? The foolish things of this world to confound the wise? Well, that qualifies everybody here, right? <laughs> it's just wonderful that God can use people like that. And, and Paul was, nobody was uh, more blown away probably than Paul that God was using him in this way. Now, what else was unusual about this? So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and evil spirits went out from them. Now, when the, the term handkerchiefs and aprons is being used here, basically, Paul made his living as a tent maker. Uh, that, that's what he did to support himself in ministry and working, again, with that kind of fabric and canvas and leather and so on. It was arduous work. You'd work up a pretty good sweat doing those sort of things. And so, in order to protect his clothing... Uh, he would have a leather apron that he would wear. Uh, in order to keep the sweat from coming down into his eyes, he would have sweatbands for his hands and for probably his forehead. Now, at the end of the day, those things, I'm here to tell you, probably smelled to high heaven. <laughs> Could you imagine if someone said to you, man, you want to see the power of God loosed in your life? Here, I got this stinky sweat sock. <laughs> you need to touch this. What? No, I'm not getting near your, your stinkies. And, and, and inside of us, right, uh, there, there's part of us that says, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've got my dignity. I'm sorry, but I've got my pride. And if you think that I, even though I've got this disease, even though uh, there's this situation where someone's demon-possessed, you think I'm going to get anywhere near that, that smelly apron or those stinky headbands, you got another thing coming. Okay, well, don't be healed. Okay, don't be delivered. You still got your pride, but you still got your disease. You still got your dignity, but you've still got this individual who's demon possessed. Which do you want more? <laughs> this, uh, this whole principle here uh, is something you can take to the bank. One of the things that you're going to discover in the Christian life is, you know, people will often say, well, you know, you Christians, you say your way is the only way. It's, it's so narrow. But, you know, I think the thing that really keeps people at an arm's length as far as a relationship with God is the narrowness of the message of Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. But also uh, another key aspect no one gets into the kingdom without bowing, without acknowledging you can't save yourself, without acknowledging I'm not bringing anything to this party. God doesn't need me. As a matter of fact, when God looks at me, I just go, why in the world would you use me in light of how messed up we all are? And we will be messed up till we see the Lord in heaven. But, but what a beautiful thing it is when we humble ourselves. If you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, the Scripture says what? He's going to lift you up. But you're never going to get there without humbling yourself, without maybe acknowledging you don't know all that, that maybe God knows things that you don't know, that maybe, just maybe, Jesus has a better grip 
on eternal reality and what life is really all about, then maybe you do. Sometimes you got to smell the sweat sock. Sometimes you got to humble yourself enough to go, okay, if this is how God's working, then that's great. And, and, you know, this really helps me out quite a bit. Because one of the, 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 the interesting things about the ministry of Jesus was he was all over that. I mean, stop and think about how Jesus healed people, right? Blind man, he spits on the ground, makes clay out of the loogie, right? And then puts it on the blind guy's face. Tells him to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. Well, once again, if that had been me, oh God, it's tough enough being blind, let alone being humiliated with this spit mud all over my face. I'm going to just wash it off and go home. Fine, I wouldn't have been healed. This guy trusted God enough to do that. Yeah, another miracle, and you can read about this in the book of Matthew chapter 9, is that when Jesus was on his way to raise uh, from the dead, a daughter of a synagogue leader by the name of Jairus. We're told that there was a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 13 years. And she said to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. So she reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment, and she knows, boom, instantly, she's been healed. And Jesus stops the whole crowd. And he says to his disciples, who touched me? And Simon Peter said, Lord, who's not touching you? We're being mobbed here. He goes, no, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing virtue go out of me. And Jesus searched through the crowd and found the woman. She was terrified. She thought, oh, you know, I, I, I touched him, and I, I had this hemorrhage, and I was defiled, and, and now he's going to be defiled. He's going to read me the right act, because that's what spiritual people do. And Jesus comes to her and says, woman... Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. You see, this is the key to unlocking the miraculous in our life. Why does God do the miraculous? What is it that allows the miraculous to flow within our lives? It's faith. Faith. Trusting God. You know, again, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 kind of faith. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. All right? Real faith isn't waiting for God to come around to my way of thinking. Sometimes that's the way we live our Christian lives. Real faith isn't saying, well, I'd like the blessing of God upon my life, but I have certain preconditions. No. Real faith, I love the acrostic, you know, and if you, you want to have something that will really help you out, what is real biblical faith all about? It, 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 it's this, forsaking all, I trust him. I ask you a question, how much do you trust God, really? Really, when it's all said and done? You know, I know what it's like for me as a fallen sinful human being. Generally speaking, I will start trusting God when I have exhausted all all other alternatives. When, when, when I have tried my level best to manage my life without God's presence, without God's power, finally I get to the end of my rope and I go, ah, oh God, I get it. I've got nothing, nothing to do here. And God goes, perfect. You're finally at a place where I can move within your life. What a revolutionary thing it would be in our walk with God if we didn't have to go through all that before we'd finally trust him. Why is God so big on this trust thing? Why does God seemingly put us in places where we have to do kind of outlandish things in order to trust him? Because you have to realize something about faith. There's no higher compliment that you can ever give to anyone than what you're willing to trust them with. Isn't that true? You know, Pam and I, on a couple of occasions in our life, have been asked to be the godparents uh, of the children uh, of people we know and love. And I'll tell you what, that tells me something about the esteem that these people hold us in. When we sat down, we worked out our will when the kids were young, and we had to come up with the names of people that we would want to raise our kids if something happened to us. That is the highest praise you can give anyone. Why? Because you're trusting that person, right, with what matters most. 
your own children. God works the same way. What are you willing to trust him with? Oh, I love singing praise songs in here, and it was just beautiful. Hearing everybody just singing, and God, the walls echoing in here because people are worshiping and praising the Lord, and that's great. But you know, there's higher praise. The highest praise is this. What am I willing to trust God with today? Are you willing to smell the sweat sock, if that's what it takes? Or do you still have your preconditions? Well, <laughs> unusual miracles for sure. And here we see this portrait of the miraculous and where it really leads and that God was doing this power. But whenever the miraculous comes up, understand there's not just an accurate presentation of the power of God. There's also individuals who want to get into it presumptuously. And boy, they are falling right in the wake of this move of ministry we see here. Look at verse 13. Then, when? When this powerful move of God was going on, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. Now, understand something. Whenever a genuine move of God gets going, you're going to have two kinds of personalities that gravitate towards it, contenders and pretenders. You're going to have people that genuinely want to run their race for the glory of God, and then you're going to want to have people that want the bennies, in a sense, without the relationship. And that's what we've got going on here. You've got these itinerant, that means they traveled about uh, practicing this as they're living, Jewish exorcists. We know a little bit about uh, the way they would go about this process during that time. Uh, they had elaborate rituals they would go through. They had drums that they would beat. They would throw water and oil upon the demonized or demon-possessed person. Uh, they would sing these loud songs, if you will. And, and, you know, to me, I think that's probably the most uh, compelling part of their itinerary, because even if someone was demon-possessed, sitting around me and hearing me sing loudly would probably cause that demon wanting to be somewhere else. <laughs> but they would do that sort of thing, and it was time-tested, and it was traditional, and, and so on, and uh, these guys uh, made a good living doing it. You know, after they go, oh, well, you know, the power of God's done here, but all gratuity is greatly accepted. Yeah, they, they, they made a good do living doing it, and they kind of had their cred, right? They were related to this individual, is referred to as a Jewish high priest, a chief priest uh, by the name of Sceva. That doesn't mean he was the chief priest in Jerusalem. It just meant that he was the highest ranked of the Jewish priestly caste that was there in Ephesus at that time. He was the big wheel. He was the Bible answer guy. He was the go-to guy. And, and so his seven sons are going around. And uh, they are practicing this exorcism. They guy, hey, did you hear this guy, Paul? Man, he's got this exorcism thing going on here, and he doesn't even have to show up, right? I mean, people just smell his stinky sweatbands, and the demons go out. He's talking about this Jesus. Hmm, well, maybe this is a technique we can use. And so they apply the technique. We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, notice what happens. And the evil spirit, verse 15, answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so they all fled out of the house naked and wounded. <laughs> now, this should illustrate a couple of things for us here, and, and you don't have to be a Greek scholar to figure this out, right? Right? When you get involved with the supernatural, right, you're in over your head. And prevailing and seeing the power of God at work in the supernatural isn't about learning the right techniques. That's not what wins the day. Now, the reason I share that with you is that, man, if you really want to get into, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess, the TikTok, the World Weekly News, the grocery store tabloid area, of the Christian life. Man, start reading books on deliverance. 
Start going online uh, and seeing the stuff that people in so-called deliverance ministries are all about. Read some of the bestsellers that are out there about how to overcome the darkness or steps to deliverance or the bondage breaker. That was a bestseller. One of my seminary profs at Talbot wrote that thing. And, you know, in the bondage breaker, uh, that particular book, you know, it was said that there were 12 steps that you had to go through in order to be delivered of demons. In fact, even more dangerous in this book was the idea that um, Christians, well, maybe they can't be possessed, but they can be demonized. In other words, a demon can get a hold of part of your life and force you to do things that you don't want to do. They call them squatter demons and things like that. If there's an area of your life that isn't surrendered to Jesus, then a demon can come in and take advantage of that particular place. And the only way to deal with that demon is to pray through the 12 steps of deliverance that were detailed in the book. Now, uh, again, uh, I'd look at this and, uh, you know, you would read some of these uh, accounts and even in the book it said, you know, this one woman had this, you know, habitual sin and, and was demonized, partially possessed. Partially possessed? Isn't that like being lightly pregnant? I mean, you either are or you aren't, right? But, oh, no, you know, and, and she, you know, did this, but she didn't get any deliverance from her habitual sin or how this was manifesting her life or the nightmares or things like that. Oh, they found out she was praying those 12 steps in the wrong order. You got to pray them in the right order. And then those demons are going to listen to you. Now, that is the triumph of technique, if you will, over truth. What is the truth about spiritual warfare? What is the truth about how we are actually delivered? Well, two things you got to understand. Number one, there is no such thing as a lightly possessed Christian. First John chapter four and verse four says, you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now notice that passage doesn't say greater is he that is in you than he that is also in you. You know, Satan and God kind of have this condo thing set up. And, and Satan gets this side of the house, and God gets this side of the house. And I, I don't know if they've got an arrangement about who gets to use the kitchen when or who pays the cable bill. But, but you know, they, they're, they're sharing. They're roommates, if you will. Nothing could be further from the truth. The presence of Jesus Christ terrifies Satan. He isn't just like, oh, you know, the Jesus kind of makes me a little uneasy the book of James, we are told, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons believe and tremble. The word tremble literally means that the hairs in the back of their necks stand up. Jesus spooks them, man, because they realize that he is going to be their ultimate judge someday. Look at the encounters that Jesus had in his earthly ministry. <laughs> They'd scream at him and say, have you come to judge us before the time? Understand something. You don't have a condo relationship with God on one side and Satan on the other. How can we overcome? How can we triumph in spiritual warfare? You don't need 12 steps. You just need to pay attention to James chapter 4 and verse 7. Here's where you get the victory. It says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, notice the first thing is submit to God. One of the reasons we have habitual sins in our life is because we like our habitual sins. You know, it's not, remember Flip Wilson, the old comedian? I know I'm really hearkening back now. But, but he had like this catch line from this character he used to do called Geraldine. And she'd say, the devil made me do it. Well, that's why I think a lot of this deliverance stuff is so popular because it lets me off the hook. Oh, I looked at pornography last week. Well, it was that demon of pornography that made me do it. I was just sitting there and he was going, oh, look at that pornography. No, no, no. We met the enemy, and he's us, right? First step towards deliverance is what? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil is a resistible foe. If you resist him, he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? Verse 8, James chapter 4, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, notice it doesn't say spend 20 minutes yelling at the devil and telling him what you think about him. 
He finds that very amusing, I think, because as long as you're yelling at him, you're not talking to God. Yell at him all day long if you want. It's not going to do you any good. Notice, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. How do you do that? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. We got to deal with us, gang. You know, our, our problem, uh, you know, isn't demon possession. Our problem sometimes is demon obsession. Oh, we, we play demon, demon. Who's got the demon? I read these books and go, you know, got the, the you know the demon of lust, and you got the demon of gambling, and you've got the demon uh, uh, of anger, and you've got you've got the demon of alcohol, and you got you know, no, 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 no. You got you. It's what you got. You got a fallen, sinful nature. And the big question you got to ask yourself is this. Do you want to be made whole? That's what Jesus asked people sometimes before he'd heal them. Do you want to be made well? Jesus might be asking you that very question today. Do you want deliverance? Do you really want me to do a work in your life? Well, here's how you get it. You submit to me. You let me come into your heart. You let me run the show. And you're going to see massive spiritual change. And if you don't, well, you think you can just do these techniques. Listen to what this demon said. Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Wasn't that a haunting question? That demon knew all about Jesus. And that demon knew all about Paul. But these seven sons of Sceva, you relate related to the right guy you know, with the itinerant, uh, you know, demon uh, casting out ministry and all of his reputation, all that stuff. Powers of darkness did not find him notable at all. Not a bit. Seven of you, who are you? And this tells me something. And it should tell you something too. God has no grandchildren. God only has people who know him. God only has people that have a genuine relationship with Jesus. And if you start monkeying around with the powers of darkness, and boy, the rise of occult is going, uh, the occult is going through the roof in this day and age. You know, you can play around with all that satanic stuff and think, ooh, you know, this is really great. And I'm going to go to Madame Lasagna's tea leaf reading room, and I'm going to get this crystal, and I'm going to read this thing about how I can tell the universe what I want it to do. And I'm going to do, you know, hey, you can go down that path seeking power or provision from the dark side. And initially it works, seemingly. But then the trap door snaps shut. It's always, always, always like that. You know, let's face it. No animal's going to get caught in a trap unless you put some pretty tasty bait there, right? Oftentimes, the tasty bait is you get to write your own ticket, you get to call your own shots, you get to apply this and that. And even in Christian circles, the faith movement, you can write your own ticket with God. You can tell God what to do if you follow our time-tested principles here. Man, oh man, I don't know about you, but I, I, I mean, I've been a Christian since 1973, and I've had to learn this lesson the hard way. The last thing in the world I want from God is for him to do things my way. I want him to do things his way. Because I have it in good authority. He's a little smarter than I am. He's been around a little bit longer than I have. And his ways will satisfy. Our ways will not. Who are you? I mean, if you encounter a demon, are they going to say that sort of thing? Now, you say, well, Scott, have you ever encountered? In my ministry career, yeah, I've had a few encounters with individuals that I believe were genuinely demon-possessed. Most of the time, people that act out in that way are probably mentally ill uh, or are kind of using it as a manipulative tactic and, and so on. But the, the surest way that you can find out uh, whether someone is really possessed or not is you say, in the name of Jesus, get out. And in those situations where people were genuinely demon-possessed, it was amazing. It, it looked, they looked like someone just hit them with a brick. You see, the demons can't stand up to the name of Jesus. But if they still carry on and do their thing, I'm like, yeah, you know, I think we've got some play acting that's going on here. But understand something. You know, if you are a genuine born-again Christian, you have all the authority necessary to deal with any demonic entity that might come your way. You don't have to be intimidated by them. You don't have to be buffaloed or spooked by them. You've got the authority to cast them out. But 
the authority comes from and should point us to a greater conclusion. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 17, we are told that after Jesus sent out 70 of his disciples and gave them power to heal and to cast out demons, they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You want to overcome darkness? Don't try to drive out the darkness. Turn on the light. Turn on the light and love of Jesus Christ. Let his word be your authority, not your experience, not your background, not your techniques, not the seminars you've gone to, not your reputation, not your religiosity, not some strange ritual, you know, throwing water on somebody or singing real loud and hoping the demon will get annoyed. No. The power of God, understand this, flows out of those who belong to him. And if you really want to understand the miraculous, you really want to move in the miraculous, here's the most important passage I think I can share with you because it's going to keep you on track and keep you out of a peck of trouble. In the book of Mark, chapter 16 and verse 17, Jesus said this to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. He said, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, Jesus said that there were going to be signs evident in the life of every born-again believer in Jesus. But notice what he says. These signs will, what? Follow those who believe. It doesn't say that believers will follow these signs because a sign is only as good as whether it points you in the right direction. And the only sign that is legitimate, no matter how splashy, no matter how spectacular, no matter how emotionally engaging or charging it might be, the only sign that you and I should follow is a sign that says, Jesus, this way. And if you follow Jesus, you know Jesus, guess what? The devil's going to know about you. But he's going to know that you belong to him. He's going to know that the power of God flows within your life. And he will use even things as bizarre as stinky sweat socks, which kind of describes our lives, right? To change a world through the power of God. Challenging question I want to leave you with today. This last week. Was there anything that happened in your life personally that is inexplicable apart from the miraculous intervention of God? Anything in your life that would have never happened unless the power of the Holy Spirit had accomplished that in your life? If your answer is, well, no, or, gee, you know, it's hard for me to think so. I'll tell you what, if God moves in a miraculous way in your life, you're going to know. And he's going to do it in his own time and in his own way. Like we said, 11 major miracles and 30 years in Acts. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't do the miraculous. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't anticipate it. Here's what you do. Wake up in the morning and say to the Lord, Lord, before I roll out of bed, fill me with the power of your spirit. Live your life out through me today. And if you need a miracle, you got it. And if a miracle doesn't seem to happen, well, maybe God's working behind the scenes. He does his best work sometimes that way. But if you don't receive a miracle that day, you know what? Because you didn't need it. God's going to guide and direct where he leads, he guides, and where he guides, he provides. Let's be people that live in that anticipation of being those that have a living hope not anything that can be imitated or simulated, not anything that can be explained or contained, but only because the true and living God dwells in our hearts. May that be what makes us different. Lord, thanks so much 
for the power of your spirit. And God, if anything comes out of this fellowship, anything comes out of this church, Lord, we don't want it to be by might or by power, by the skillful plannings of man, uh, by the, the, the fact that we just happened along in the right place at the right time, and oh, you know, I guess things worked out, or that individuals are gifted and talented with music or the message or anything else. We want this to be a place where the only possible explanation for our existence is a move and miraculous power, a powerful move of your spirit. And Lord, if that's true about us collectively, we sure want it to be true about us individually. Lord, help us to search our hearts. And if there are things like pride, like, uh, like self-sufficiency, like relying on religion instead of relationship that have blocked that free flow of your spirit in our lives, uh, we just want to acknowledge that before you. We want to ask you to forgive us for that, to change us and transform us, to be people that enjoy the excitement and adventure of following your Son, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the, the amazing experience we have in the Christian life. Fill us now, even right now by faith, with the power of your Spirit, so that even before we get out of here today, we might even see you move in miraculous ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, a reminder to you, week from today, Easter Sunday. You know, if uh, you know some people who would never darken the door of a church any other day, the old c and E's, I guess they call them. You know, I see sometimes uh, Christians sort of sneering about that. Oh, Christmas and Easter, you know, they're, they're there. Hey, we love c and E's in this church. Because a lot of c and E's need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what they're going to hear next Sunday. 6.30 a.m., our sunrise service. And 9 o'clock, our regular service here. Start praying about some people that you could invite out who need to hear a message of life and hope on the resurrection of Jesus and how it will change every other relationship you got. Let's pray that the Lord does a miraculous and mighty move of his spirit this Easter. Let's all stand and let's wrap up with one last song of praise. Just really quick before we do our last song, just the spirit was, was prompting me, as Pastor Scott mentioned in his message, just because we come to a church doesn't automatically mean we're saved. So I just want to give really quickly, we can take just a couple minutes out of our day, for anybody here that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who has never made that commitment, that decision, there's a weight of sin upon you. God says to flee from the wrath to come. And I just want to pray right now, if anybody in this room, sometimes we don't make the right decisions unless we're prompted to. So I just want to give that chance right now. Let's all bow our heads in prayer. We can all repeat the prayer after me. And it's not the words you're speaking. It's what you're saying in your heart. You're crying out to the Lord Jesus that he is your Savior, that you know that you have a weight of sin that you cannot deal with because we've all sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. The, weight of, the wages of sin is death and eternity apart from God, everlasting fire, but Jesus has saved you from that. And this, is, this could be your day right now. If anybody's on the edge, you don't know what can happen. This could, be your, this could be your chance right now. So I just want to give, give this opportunity. I'm led by the Lord right now. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned. And I know, Lord, that my sins have separated me from you. But I believe that you, Jesus, are my Savior. You died for my sins. And you rose again from the grave to give me eternal life. I turn away from my sins and I receive you into my heart. I believe you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And I invite you into my life right now. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. And help me walk with you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. If anyone in here prayed that prayer today, thank you, Lord. All right, let's sing our last song. Sing in death and life. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My death is paid. There's nothing that separate my heart from your great love, your love, and your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me, your 
hope you all have a great week. Come forward if you'd like any prayer. It's just like...